Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is the alternative session from the BIP models that we wanted to add um, an element of um, talking about restorative justice. And I'm really excited to be a part of this today. Um, I do not recall, um, or if we did talk about an order that you were going to run this in, but um, Rod, do you want to take it from here? Yes. I just want to again appreciate um, my brother here and my sister, you know, Jeremy and Jolene. Uh, I'm going to, I'll start out and then I think that Jolene will and then uh, Jeremy. But, um, you know, restorative justice, you know, we talk about a lot of these terms, a lot of vocabulary, a lot of system work, a lot of these things. And, you know, looking at from a traditional historical uh, view of what that is. I mean, it, these, these, all these things we have just have come about throughout a colonization of how we name things, how we do things, how we're already involved in things. You know, it's interesting to hear a lot of things that my co facilitator in the past that we were trying to do, now it's happening, you know, working with women working with families with children i mean all these things that's that's just now here and like i've always said the terminology of all these things you know and what what it means our own different understanding of certain things so when i when when we're told to do a restorative justice you know it kind of just hit me to to the point to where you know i mean these this this that's we we've already have been doing this our ancestors the way of life, I mean, that with indigenous people, that's that's what it was, no matter how it was, you know, no matter what the circumstances was. But this, you know, some is documented, some isn't. You know, a lot of this is, is the verbal passage of traditions and cultures. And a lot of this, you know, through Salmonial, through our spiritual leaders, through the foundation of our people you know, which was killed off throughout the time of colonization, all the things that occurred. I mean, you know, this continent of North and South America, all indigenous people, we all had our own language. We had millions of people, a lot of animals, certain things, so many stuff, you know, but you know, that again, to understand history, that's why I uh, have, everybody to give out the, uh, this, this uh, planting to see, to take a look at everything that, that, that we're doing is all inclusive. There's not one thing, and that's the thing of it, with institutionalized systematic approaches, it's always about one thing, you know, and how we do things and what, it's, what that concept is and, and what that policies and procedures can only do and the, and the funding that we have to to, to try to bring cultural relevance into our communities. And so it's so a lot of layers when we look at it. And when we talk about restorative justice, it's about healing. It really comes down to, it's about healing. How do we heal from all the things that occurred and that has, has uh, is occurring from our, from our ancestries all the way up, uh, our, our ancient ones all the way up to our families, our, our grandparents, our elders, um, all the things that occurred, the, the impacts that happened to us, um, just the, the substance abuse, the wars, just on and on. It's, it's not one thing, it's all things. And restorative justice to me, to me, you know, and that's what we're doing here, you know, little bits of things, little bits of pieces of trying to restore balance, harmony, that, that again, healing, in ways that we're trying to approach within our communities, within our own self, as organizations, as people, as staff, you know, 
knowing, and that's why I always, my term is always self-work first before even doing anything, because that's where it begins. It begins from within. Again, the Wabrighty movement with Don Quest, that's about, again, the whole essence of, it's 12 steps, but it's now, it's no, nothing new to us as indigenous people. That was way of life. All, we just lost it throughout the time of history. Everything that our ancestors, our ancient ones had talked about, it's here, it's, it's, it's relevant, it's within us, it's, it's now it's being discovered and it's named. Mm -hmm. know what it is just like the dna they knew mm -hmm. the trauma and again how things are being reworded you know it's about w trauma wisdom you know it's what i hear you know because the wisdom that we've gained throughout our trauma we're changing things and now a new generation is coming so when we took a restorative justice how do we include how is it inclusive of everybody instead of just one individual or, or, or one family. It's a community effort in what we're trying to do. And again, helping our communities, helping ourselves. And so again, it's, 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 it's just the foundation, you know, of the, of the beginning of our, of our lives and in, 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 in incorporating everything that we've known through, through education, through, again, through the trainings, through to whatever services, that collaboration, the peace, everything that we're doing to bring it back what's relevant within our own communities. Mm -hmm. How we're incorporating that to have family involvement. And that's a challenge because our communities are hurt and broken. And there's a lot of anger, guilt, shame, and fear. And so again, trust, how are we relating in that to become a family, uh, 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 again, a community, a people of, bringing that really, again, trust level to make that healing possible and change. We still have many, many things in our communities. Some are really proactive as far as, you know, spiritual leaders and some aren't. And so as humans, you know, there's a lot of, mis again, mistrust within that in ourselves, you know, but then again, it's, it's as service providers, that's, that's what our essence or that's what our being is what we're trying to do to reach out to have something creative, you know, to co create to re to reestablish to reconnect to re again re inform to re educate, you know, to all these, these, these relearning rebirth of who we are, you know, as our communities. And so again, you know, we can talk about it, we can do these things, but it comes with little things. One thing I just want to say, you know, many, many, again, evidence-based, practice-based, um, all these things we talk about, research and statistics. You know, a good example of indigenous cultures that's documented is, again, uh, 1883, Crow Dog. Uh, Crow dog case again, where they both there was a killing within the the, the the tribe, the Sioux tribe, and so again the restorative justice, reconciliation, how they did that was within, but then the cavalry, the the government got involved and saw looked at it as a murder, you know, case, and they went to court, and so as time went on, they realized that. It's in the reservation and they couldn't do anything because they had no laws in place. See, all these laws came from the, the, our European ancestors. And so that's what we're still living, you know, with this, all these laws. And so as time went on, no one really knows what happened, but then they had some way of restoring, you know, the families with these, with that individual to replacing the honor, you know, the dignity, the, the things and each, again, tribal nations is unique in ways that we do these things. It's, there's, it's, we don't generalize in ways that, that things occur. There's certain specific things that individual, but there's a process in place. Even we had a process in place that was immediate. Even death was immediate, you know, for circumstances. So again, we had our own way of restorative justice, restore, restoring that, that honor within ourselves and our communities. And accountability, we talk about that's a big word. That was part of again the living of it, to to be that that person that you are, you know, in a good way with good intentions. 
And many of us and indigenous people know that, you know, it's, it's through our prayers and our spirits and all these things that we know that we're connected to within. It's ingrained in us, you know, that, that, that well-being and the energies that we talk about, you know, yes, there's dualities, positive and, and negative. But then again, it's how, how we've learned, what is it that's passed on through us? But again, coming back to being that humanness of what it is as far as being restored to your healing process of who you are to be capable and, and intentionally good with everything that's occurring around us. And we're all interrelated with all things. It's just not humans. It's all the, we're the, we're the keepers of the earth and we forget that of the universe. And so again, it's just going back to really basic stuff, but that's hard to do because we're disconnected. So I just wanted to put that out just to kind of take a look at it from a historical context of, you know, restorative justice. We name all these things and then we import it, implement and, and, and try to do all this as far as what it really means or goals and objectives. But when it comes down to it, it's about common sense and how you approach if individuals and families and how you put that structure in place to have people involved, to have that safe space to, again, trauma-informed care. I mean, that's, again, our ancestors' way of life, you know? So again, all these things. So, so I just wanted to bring that up. And again, um, just thank you, just, uh, I hope I, like I said, this is my perspective. This is the way I see things, you know, you know it's it, you know, documentation. It's, it's a big process as far as to do the research and all this, but I'll let the younger ones do all that since they have the knowledge. So, yeah. all right, thank you. So. As you were talking, I thought of a, another example of uh, I was up in Ketchikan, and we were we were at this park where they had a bunch of totem poles put up. And one of the things, other than uh, the traditional uses of it, was it was one way to restore accountability and balance. So if someone harmed, if I harmed you, uh, you would go and create this totem pole, this image, and create this ugly caricature of me, right? And then you would put it in front of my house. <laughs> so it wasn't like the elaborate four level kind of beans. It was usually just a one character type of caricature of, of like the ugliness that I presented. And so you would put that in front of my house and then I would have to go make things up to you and do something to honor you to restore that balance. And then you would come over and then remove that totem pole. Mm -hmm. right? And so I think about that kind of stuff, right? Where even where we get petty today about things, and then we said, we, we, we try to keep balance and maintain balance and we decide how important is this harm done to me? So if I'm not gonna go cut a tree, shave off the bark, carve it, dig a four foot hole, bury this thing and wait for you to respond, <laughs> I'm gonna let a lot of crap go, right? I'm not gonna be judgy, gossipy, you know, whatever. I'm gonna not be so bitter or, you know, just figure out what level does it really rise to that? And so I just love that when we have these conversations that these stories come out and that we can share. A lot of hearsay and wow, a lot of impeached uh, testimony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Yes, I mean, there's so much, you know, and, you know, I know you've been in a lot of places and, and again, Jolene too, I mean, she can bring a lot of this stuff up and from a, a, a humanistic, you know, but like I said, you know, I mean, we had so much, you know, it's just that we've lost these teachings. These teachings are lost and we're trying to relearn, you know, but many have, have gone, you know, so that's where mm -hmm. our, 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 our heart goes out to try to get these insights, you know? Right, right. It definitely takes like a very humanistic um, way of looking and I think that's the reconnection that if we're talking about um, addressing folks that cause harm, right, is how are we being, uh, how are we incorporating the humanity along with the prayers and traditions and cultural knowledge that we know of how we restore that. Um, and this is such a great conversation. I don't want to, I don't know, if, uh, is it okay if I go next now, Rod? All right, just want to make sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jolene Holgate, and I'm the Training and Education Director at the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women 
uh, for my Dinef relatives, uh, she a was a lemon slant the look at the net of us's team, hush on so had the shade though, it would have cheated the shimala chanto had dan a yusina shah. Uh, originally from a small community called Shanto in the northeastern Arizona, a uh, piece of the Four Corners. Um, but I am a transplant here to so called Albuquerque, which is Tiwa territory. We want to recognize our relatives um, whose lands we do reside on here in New Mexico, um, specifically in my area, the Pueblo of Isleta, Pueblo of Sandia, and Pueblo of Santa Ana. And um, I prepared some slides. I'm a visual person, um, and it just helps me. Uh, so, yeah. Let me just go ahead and share my screen here. And I just want to say I'm very happy and honored to join my brothers, uh, Rod and Jeremy, in this discussion. They certainly have been at the forefront of these types of conversations and really finding ways that support our men uh, in communities and our relatives who cause harm in our communities um, in so many different ways. Um, so what I wanted to do is just center, how are we creating that healing through restorative practices, especially when we're talking about batter intervention programming. What we do recognize is that the prevalence of violence that are, that is being experienced in our tribal communities, especially towards our native women, our trans women, and our non-binary uh, relatives, is that this violence is actually coming from our native men. Um, Contrary to a lot of beliefs out there where a lot of the violence is happening from non-Native relatives throughout the country, uh, that definitely is true in, in certain parts, especially Northern pieces of the United States, so like South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, especially where they have uh, high cases of MMIW that's happening there. However, what we're seeing, and this is actually according to a report that was put out by the New Mexico Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is that a lot of the violence happening towards Native women in our state is from our Native men. And that definitely is concerning and recognizing that and being able to name that because I think that's an area where we've never really been able to say that out loud because the conversation has always centered violence coming from non-Native male people. Although it does happen, it does happen within our communities. Um, and what we do understand is that women are, can cause harm, and we do understand that they are also capable of being perpetrators of violence uh, within their own family or within the, their own communities. What sets this apart, though, and why we our target audience are those who cause harm, specifically men, is that a lot of the violence that's being perpetrated against Indigenous women leads to homicide. It leads to the loss of a life. And that's why it's really important that when we have these conversations, we are centering women, we're centering uh, trans women, as well as our queer and non-binary relatives uh, because of this fact. We also recognize that the cause of violence in our communities is very insidious and it's covert. So it's not black and white. What that means is it's really easy for us to say um, it's alcoholism, it's drug addiction, it's um, you know, lack of economic development or it's unemployment. Those things that we are, that we can see, which are tangible, um, are truths. But what I want to say is that those are actually symptoms of what's really going on and why this is happening. Um, and those are very surface level. So this brings me to my next point is that recognizing where those root causes of violence happen, especially um, uh, violent perpetrations towards our men and uh, our women and uh, children is that that stems from colonization. It stems from the implementation of patriarchy as colonization was happening. It's through white supremacy and the historical trauma that uh, so many generations of our indigenous people uh, have experienced. And those pieces of history are really important to be acknowledged because it set up a system and a structure that really started to work against tribal communities. Um, things like the lack of uh, land ownership. Um, and I love to use this example because, you know, a lot of folks feel like tribes get a huge piece of like federal funding, things are given to us, but that doesn't mean anything when you're trying to start your own way of life 
Um, and a lot of it is connected to land. Um, for instance, as a Navajo person, I can't purchase land home at home. If I wanted to build a home out home at, up back at my land area, I'd have to do a lease process. And because I don't own land, I don't have any asset. I don't have any type of collateral. So contractors and banks aren't going to take a chance on me. And so you have to think about the structures that are put in place that work against indigenous people. So with this, it comes the lack of housing security, the lack of food security, the lack, lack of economic development and opportunities, lack of employment. And those are all symptoms of the structures that are in place right now um, that lead to systemic oppression as well as, it, as well as even systemic racism. Additionally, another layer um, especially here in New Mexico, it's important that we recognize that colonization is very layered in our state, meaning that it wasn't just our history that started at 1492, but it also came with um, the Spanish colonization, the Mexican colonization, and then soon after the colonization from the United States. Uh, so our history is very layered in terms of what colonization looks like and how that intergenerational trauma passes down. And a lot of this led to the gender-based violence that we experience today. Um, and why I bring this up is because the structure is put in place. Patriarchy is a piece of that structure. Um, this certainly was something that was taught and indoctrinated into our uh, men and boys um, as they were growing up and, and being assimilated to these systems that we know today. I love sharing this quote because when we think about violence prevention, a lot of the times we forget to include that our men and boys are also a part of this conversation, whether they cause harm or don't cause harm. I love this quote by Bell Hooks. The first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence towards women. Instead, patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in acts of psychic self-mutilation that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. So why it's really important to understand these patriarchal notions which come from Western indoctrination is that it teaches our men and boys to suppress those feelings. Um, they're also taught that femininity is weak. They're also taught um, these notions that you know women are um, weak, the weaker sex of the two. And this can lead to things like gender-based violence, homophobia, and even just the outright hatred of women. And that's what patriarchy teaches. Um, a lot of these types of indoctrination certainly happened during the boarding school uh, era when our, so like my parents, for instance, they're boarding school um, survivors. And my dad had to take industrial classes. Like he had to teach, they were teaching him how to be the head of the household how to be the person who handles the finances, where my mom was taught to sew, to be in the kitchen, you know, what does it mean to be a mother? So these types of roles, because of the structures put in place, began to seep into our communities. Um, so that's why it's, I just love this quote, because this didn't happen from anywhere. And like, how do we reconnect to that? So kind of touching on what uh, Mr. Cascala said earlier, my brother, is that we recognize, especially historically, even before colonization, the responsibilities that we had within our communities. Um, we did certainly have roles that were either men or women or relatives who might what we call transgender. Um, we had traditional names for folks that had gender identities that were um, fluid. Um, but in any case, we all had an equitable place within our societies. And this meant that we leaned on community. We realized that we held collective power that worked to have safe communities. Um, what this means is, as Mr. Cascala said, is it was done through prayer. It was also done through how we took care of each other. You know, folks who may have uh, had an agricultural way of life um, how was that, you know, food distributed? Our relatives who may have done hunting um, or maybe foraged, how are they also distributing that back within community? And a really great example that Jeremy brought is that when someone causes harm, 
there were ways of restoring what that looked like. And it really had um, a lot to do with the community culture, the community structure, and how everyone took care of one another. It's also rooted in kinship, meaning that we have a responsibility to one another that's rooted in love and liberation. And this was definitely equal on so many terms. Um, we had relatives that, um, like if, if I could use my own Navajo experience, I know growing up, um, I had a lot of love for my father and he recognized that I wasn't someone that was wanting to be indoors, you know, traditional Western gender roles. So my dad, you know, it wasn't a thing. Like I, I was outside with the horses. I was following him around, cleaning up corrals and getting hay and hauling water and all of those things. And not once in my life did anyone ever say like, um, you have to do this because you're a woman. It was more of, if you can do this, let's show you how to do it. Um, and it really had a lot to do with the relatives recognizing who I am as a person and what how I connected my role into my own kinship system. Um, so that knowledge would come from my uncles. The knowledge would also come from my aunties who grew up the same way. Um, and that's how kinship always played a role. And that's more of a contemporary example because what I wanna say is that we're not a monolith. We're not a societies that um, operated like this way back then. We still continue to operate like this today. Um, and those are the reconnections that are really important to our, our well-being and also to our liberation from these systems and structures that were placed upon us. I also wanna say that our responsibility includes um, land. Our ways of life are directly tied to, um, to how we care for the land, how we care for Nahasban, which we call it our earth mother. Um, she is the one who takes care of us. She's the one that provides and provides um, all of the things that we need to sustain uh, our everyday lives and how we take care of each other. Um, and that sense of honoring um, our mother, our earth mother, um, that's really a, where a lot of the basis of teachings are. So when we're talking about restorative practices in uh, tribal communities, it really should come from a place of how are we fostering that healing? Um, when we're working with relatives who may have caused harm, of course, it's really important that we center those survivors and really talk about what does accountability look like. We also have to recognize that our men and boys are not disposable. Uh, again, we had ways of restoring what that looked like when relatives may have caused harm towards another person. Um, and we realized that kinship doesn't end when harm is caused. Kinship continues their place in community continues, their relationship to the land continues. We also utilize, um, it's important to also utilize peacemaking techniques um, that utilize our cultural values. Uh, our values have always taken care of us uh, as indigenous people, um, folks from your respective tribes, from your respective nations, certainly had these um, ways of knowing that took care of community and allowed us to thrive for time immemorial. So those are really important in terms of how we create that space for healing. It's also an opportunity to foster conversations on community accountability. Again, Jeremy gave that really great um, example of the totem. Um, I know uh, in terms of like Diné people, when harm is caused, we go, we either utilize our fundamental law or families are able to talk about what does that look like for them? What, what, is, what makes it square? What makes it um, okay for this person to begin to, begin to re-enter into uh, their community or their homes and what that looks like? So that definitely is an opportunity. Is that, you know, having a healing circle where persons who cause harm are um, maybe having community gardens or is it chopping wood where they distribute it to elders? Um, what does that accountability look like at the community level? One question that I would ask to, especially our relatives who are um, from indigenous communities that are working as providers is how do we indigenize ways of how we heal persons who cause harm? Um, a lot of the conversation of course is correcting 
whatever that behavior may have been, but also how are we supporting our men and boys? Um, the, the behavior to harm doesn't come from anywhere. And how are we creating spaces where um, that healing can begin, where they can recognize where it comes from so that it's not projected as violence, but it's projecting from a place of understanding and how they're able to reconnect back into their community um, in a good way. Um, I think when it comes to restorative justice, it's an equal playing field, it's, it's equal. So you have the person who causes harm has a chance to express what it is that they need to, but also the survivor or the person who was hurt. Um, and it really is about that reconciliation. So what does this look like in practice? Um, if we were to reconnect and utilize all those steps that we were talking about before, it creates that path to reconciliation and re-entering the community. Um, it's daunting and it's scary. Um, what I wanna say is everyone has the capability to cause harm in one way or another. And I think it doesn't stop at the behavior, but it, it continues on to how do we bring this person back in in a good way? And that's the responsibility um, that's equal between all parties um, in this instance. It also offers an opportunity for input in how to reshape those relationships. Um, how do they, uh, does the relationship grow? Um, what are those boundaries and what are those healthy habits that are being implemented as they're re-entering into community and the folks that, um, that they are accountable to? This also leads to agreement building. Um, those hard conversations about what needs to happen um, should, should work towards closure. And what does that agreement look like between, um, and this is a, a very you know, popular um, peacemaking technique is that agreement building. These practices should also foster healthy masculinity and supports fatherhood and kinship. Um, I have some resources at the end there's this really great uh, healthy masculinity toolkit that just came out this week. And I would encourage folks, especially if you're working in VIP to take a look at that toolkit. It's really, really amazing. It's awesome. Um, but we should also be having healing spaces where um, how do our, our men and boys um, engage in healthy masculinity practices? Um, how are we also supporting the fatherhood? Um, it's hard, it's a hard, these are hard conversations to navigate. Um, and lastly, uh, peacemaking supports healing, but also the reconnection of our values and traditions have always taken care of our tribal communities. And I think we just need to recognize that. Um, we have a lot of wonderful uh, ways that VIP programming has developed throughout time, you know, with allies um, through the system. So how do we also integrate these pieces of indigenous knowledge and, and values that have always supported our communities um, in, for time immemorial? So here are some resources and you'll get a copy of these slides. I can drop it into the chat as well. Um, there's the link here to the New Mexico Healthy Masculinities Toolkit. It's really cool. I highly recommend checking that out. And here are some uh, organizations that support um, relatives who might be looking to strengthen and grow in the ways that feel good to them. And I will drop my information in there. Um, let me stop sharing here. So this is, I wanna say this is existing um, knowledge that we have. And I think these are existing conversations that we've had. Um, but it's not being highlighted. And I would uh, encourage, especially our providers and our advocates, as you're doing your advocacy, as you're doing these trainings, or as you're working with survivors, or if you're working with uh, persons who cause harm, um, what are some of those restorative practices that you can um, tune back into? Um, those are just some questions for you to reflect on. So with that, I, I'll pass it to my brother, Jeremy here. Great. Thank you, Julian. Hello, my name is Jeremy Neville Ciro. I work with Wicha Agli. That's a Dakota organization based in um, Rosebud, South Dakota. But I am Ojibwe and Winnebago. 
So yeah, a little bit of a mix. But child leave means to return a man. And that's the concept that our organization employs and our work is focused on engaging men and youth and doing batters intervention programming. And that concept to return a man is based on this whole notion of who we're supposed to be in our community. So when someone does harm, they are they are not putting those things in the community that they should. Uh, much like the whole things that Jolene was just showing on those different lists about what are our priorities and values and all those things. So there are things that you're supposed to do as a man. You're supposed to earn your status in community versus nowadays you're entitled to status in the community. I've always said that in order to get certain things, all you have to do is live long enough, <laughs> right? When you're a little kid, you get to start swearing, right? You're about seven, eight years old. You just have to live that long. Uh, you kiss a girl, you start having sex, all those things. You get a job, got to live long enough, live 14, 15, get a permit, get a driver's license at 16, start working, 18, get to go to the casino, 21, get to drink at the casino. <laughs> Finally, when you're 25, you get to rent the car to drive to Vegas, go to big casinos, all these other things, right? All these entitlements that you don't earn those things. And then our concept in the past is that you earn those things. And that's that work that we're tying into what we're doing, that work uh, working with Rod for all these years, doing batters intervention, coordinate community response work <coughs> is where we're trying to put that in place. We're putting these concepts in place around the community accountability or accountability to the community. The CCR work is also about those people in those institutional places who are accountable to the community that you're in those jobs to provide protection and help and healing. That's your role inside of there. But this reverse concept through colonization is about you are in those positions of power now and that you decide what to do with your authority. So it's no longer listening to the community. It's about my perspective. Jeremy's in this position now, so Jeremy gets to the side versus Jeremy carries the voices of many people behind me. And those people who help put me in those elected positions or uh, my job position, all those other things, we all know what great leadership looks like. Great leadership is always in consultation with. And so taking these two pieces, how are we going to put this together, right? So we go from the past and the history, and then we start hearing about restorative justice coming really big in the 90s. It was just a popular thing. And then some people said, they, you know, they went all the way up to Canada to find this. Oh, those Canadians are doing great things. Well, this is, it's been all around. But the thing is, people like to take something that's outside of their own norm and adapt it and create something different. So what we see happening with restorative justice does not look anything like the native concepts in which they were originated. So that the uh, crow dog versus spotted eagle, the case that Rod's referring to, that's they the federal government used that to take away authority uh, for tribes to uh, handle felony level cases. So high level cases, they're like, no, 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 we don't like the way Indians handle that. We, you know, it's gonna be our job now. And actually there's more political stuff behind it that uh, they were more supporting Spotted Eagles tribe. So they wanted to, to get back at the other tribe. And so there's a conflict between the two. So it's really, it's just this big political mess, right? But you see the deterioration and the erosion of that. And we, we no longer have the full picture. We're left with an essence. And that's what people are working off of now. They're like, oh, it's Indian stuff. Let's do restorative justice. The Indians been doing it and they do things well. Our systems are no longer in place to do those things well. We had a lot of factors in place to have vital, protected, uh, healthy, strong communities. Things were abnormal to, uh, to have this level of violence. For someone to, to, to do something that was a very serious crimes, you were booted out of the community. Some people were banished forever. Some people were banished temporarily. But when you were banished, you were sent away somewhere. It was a spot. You could say it was a jail in essence, but people were sent to check in on you. They were sent to look after you to make sure you were doing what you're doing in order to come back. And if you weren't able to come back to the community, then you were gone for good. My favorite thing is 
This is the Indian Sex Offender Registry. It was around for thousands of years before internet, computers, notification. You had a pinky at one point, you did a sexual crime, it got cut off and you were out, you were booted. And we all knew that. We all knew when someone came around and they were missing, they got a little stumpy pinky to watch out for that person. That, that we had that around a thousand years ago. So we had means and measures in place. The thing that we've lost over time because of this colonization and um, the looting of things, we will find them. We will find them around, but they look different. So we have to identify them and name them a bit more. And that's the thing that we have going on. When I see what practices that are based around restorative justice concepts that are working. Uh, the first one when it was around the 90s, it was the drug courts that were really pulling the people in who had the knowledge, skill, and ability to intervene. Over here in domestic violence cases, everyone was going out in the community saying, we want these restore, uh, uh, these, these, these uh, healing circles, restorative justice circles, whatever they were calling them. And people were like, well, you bring the community together. Everyone can be involved. And really what you had is, well, the community that was creating the problem are not the good people to be the solution because they just perpetuated and reinforced all the stuff. Yeah, there's some good things that came in and out, but time and time again, we still heard that the basis of the disagreements in the household were like, well, she's not cooking and cleaning or being a good mother, or he's not working, he's not drinking, and they just started to do the mediation things, and people were left without really things in place. So to do the good concepts, to implement a good structure, the way that it's playing out nowadays and where I see it is the way the DV courts are structured and set up. You have people who have the, the most knowledge, skill, and ability who are involved in helping that person change their behavior. Much like we sent people off out to the island or whatever spot they went to, and they were monitored by other people who went to check in on them and make sure they're doing what they're doing. We that that happens in the drug courts, or the it, well, drug courts and the DV courts. Now you have batters intervention that are part of it. The advocates are there, part of that safety. The probation's there. Judges are there. Prosecutors are there. Law enforcement's around. So you got all these core people to ensure that that safety is happening and that that person is being accountable and doing what they should be doing in order to restore that back to the community. And that's one of the biggest parts that gets that gets lost along the way when we say, well, anyone willy nilly can come part, come be part of this. If you wanna be effective, you, you gotta have skill at doing it, right? You know, we can take our whole panel of people right here and start a softball team, doesn't mean we're gonna be any good. <laughs> so. You want to have some skill, ability, some training, some practice. You have some stuff in order to be good at what you're doing. Because there's many instances where it's not. It's, it's just not good. And people don't fully understand the rationale. If I have my concepts and beliefs that I'm bringing in, and I'm not uh, adhering to the concepts and principles in which it's founded, we're not going to have the good results. And so just by taking things and say, well, this is the way it looked. So let's just practice the way it looked. But if we don't have the belief and understanding that goes with it, saying, what are we truly trying to do here? Then we're not going to have that good result. And so the other things that people have been doing to implement and, and get to those places, various levels of that, saying, all right, so we'll have some time uh, to uh, get people who don't want to do face-to-face -face conflict between uh, the, the partners. So some people will use a surrogate. So they won't have the actual person who did the offending. They'll find a different offender and they meet with a victim. And so people are doing a lot of different things to, to help create this understanding and create that healing process along the way. And so at least a victim will get an understanding from a different person on what their mindset is if they can't have that conversation with their former partner about that about that issue. And I think that's the biggest thing that we have to, to wrap our heads around is how do we do this in such a way and understand the concepts of trauma and healing as we go forward? We, we know that there's a certain amount of time where trauma is debilitating, but we also know in order to heal, 
and going back through our least our teachings that we understood that trauma exists, but we, we understood it in different ways. There's a way of healing. We went through from the 80s where it was all therapy and rooted in mommy issues, daddy issues to the 90s and where it was, well, how'd you feel about that? You know, very, very lame way approaching this kind of stuff to now we understand, well, there's trauma and then people are now mixed on trauma informed. Being a, some people interpret to say, I've had training on trauma, so I'm trauma informed here. But trauma informed really means an institution is set up and designed to work with people who are dealing with lots of trauma. You know, you know, people who get very rigid with rules and structures and stuff like that, that's not a trauma informed place. Places that, uh, that understand what people are dealing with and don't put up a rule every time someone tries to get over on them are dealing with that individual's trauma. And that the way that when we look at things and teachings and uh, the, the Ojibwe word for truth is to look at things from all sides and we connect it to why is it that we go through trauma in our head over and over again. It's because it's like a ball. We're looking at it from all sides. We have to look at that from every single point on that ball of that incident that happened so we can understand it. That's why it's replaying over and over in your head. It's not that you're you're stuck and you can be stuck because there's points that you cannot venture through, but your brain is very naturally accustomed to adapting and overcoming. Just like Rob was talking about, we know that. We know that that trauma is the past. In uh, the Ojibwe creation story, there's part of the teachings in there that you are an empty vessel and you are just to experience things in life. And part of that experience may be a negative thing. It may be positive things, but no matter what it is, you can't change the experience. It'll always be there. You can only change the way you look at it. So when you're coming at something that's traumatic and you're caught and it's an obstacle, you start looking at it for different ways. And eventually what you're gonna do is find yourself on the other side of that experience. So you look at it differently, not from this side, you look at it from this side. And usually most of us who are involved in this work, we see the people who have some tra traumatic experience in history become some of the greatest advocates and leaders. And so that's how we take that negative experience and turn it into a positive one and create that energy. All right, thank you, Jeremy and Jolene. You know, it's like, like I said, inclusiveness of all things, even all genders, everything that we were used with our ancestors, and this is what's lost, is, is we talk about these teachings. And yes, I mean, how, how, how far can we back, go back? Who, who knows about these things? And it's, and it's individually, you know, is, is what's happening. Certain, certain tribes, different tribes, you know, nations are doing things already, you know, in some capacity. We all have our own way of doing things, you know, and it's, it's, it's not, again, uh, it, it, it's really about living, living that life yourself to be that model, mm -hmm. to, to be that person that somebody can at, at least have a glimpse. See, that's how our, our teachings were. Our elders lived that life. So we saw what, how they acted, how they behaved, how the ceremonial was. And, and it's the women were all matriarchal, you know? I think all cultures, was a matriarch at one time. But again, that's why we still have that, there's the, that sharing. We, we, we share that, whatever it is, in, in some ways we share things. It's not about ownership, you know? It's, it was, you know, this, this colonization help, uh, in, in, ingrained that onto us. I mean, that's, that's a whole history you can take a look at, but just the basicness of our humanity is again, is, is, is we never owned anything. We all shared something, even in, I mean, that's still practice, you know? Like uh, my sister said, the hunting, you know, how that's shared. And there's a way, again, if you wanna use Western terminology, there's, pro, there were already, there's already protocols in place to do certain things in a spiritual sense. You know, it's not about religion or dogmatic, Religion, it's about spirituality, which is we're all interconnected. It's, it's just where this kinship comes in. Everything out there is, is alive, and we honor that living. 
the tree, the insect, the sand, the earth, the mud, moon, star, sun, it goes beyond the universe. And so our creation story is that we already traveled to galaxies. So again, that's, that's, that's nothing new. It's just that we're trying to relearn and again, put this back in practice as far as our own individual lives within our own self. And we're so challenged now because of we, it's a whole generation coming out, you know, that's mm -hmm. coming to, to, to this technology world. And, and again, how do you incorporate teachings that are in person and participating, you know, in these, these traditional doings and our language, you know, so again, so, so that's the, that's the, again, rebirthing, relearning, re-educating, re-reforming the honoring of what we are as far as what restorative justice really is and what we're doing, you know, so we're doing bits and pieces, you know, but, you know, this is, again, another good understanding and being open to it, you know, I mean, that's the thing. When you say BIP, everything's relevant. It doesn't matter what it is. It, nothing's insignificant. Everything is, 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 you can work with it to make them, again, that's how change. And like you said, the powerful change happens when individuals themselves change and become that example to be that core, again, leader in their community, in their family. And that's occurs. And again, you know, victims coming out of it to be powerful. I think a lot of us in this work have our own experiences. That's why we're here, majority of us in some capacity. Anyway, so yes, so we got, yeah. we got about 10 more minutes. So I wanna thank you. Anything, uh, I don't know if yeah. you guys have well, anything else to I share. Just, I just wanted to just kind of echo all of that you said, um, Rod, and I just always, Hearing you speak is always so much knowledge learning for me. Um, and I think as we think about the structures that that are in place that we think about um, is how how are we dismantling some of these systems, especially patriarchy, right? And and really informing folks that it oppresses men. And I think when we hear that term patriarchy, the first thing we think of is like, oh, feminism. Oh, it's you know, it's a woman's issue. And it's no, you know, the liberation of our communities from violence is liberation of our men and boys. It's the liberation of um, all of these pieces that were um, infected by what happened historically. And I think once we are able to understand that, I, I think that that conversation is where healing happens. Um, and that definitely looks different for tribal communities, you know, for public communities, Diné communities, you know, Ojibwe communities. Um, and there are existing programs that are working. Um, I know the Navajo Nation's peace, Navajo Nation's uh, peacemaking program um, utilizes that fundamental law to really take a holistic look at um, what does that restoration look like? Um, a lot of the tenants that are based in our lives is on what we call hojon, which, you know, is harmony, it's beauty, it's um, this balance that we have in our lives um, that each and every one of us are born with from the onset. So when we recognize those harms, we're putting those balances back together. We're putting um, that healing for the person who um, either was harmed or the person who caused harm. And and it's such a hard conversation to have today just because of um, the type of um, Western Westernization that's happened. For me, as a survivor of sexual violence and a survivor of domestic violence, um, getting to that point where you can forgive the person who's harmed you, the person who have harmed you is really tough. Um, but that's the side we see a lot, right? And I think the other side to that is how are we also fostering the traumas that are happening to those who cause harm? Um, I believe in a, a peacemaking group up north, I can't remember the nation, um, but a young man had you know, caused harm and, and physically assaulted an older person in his tribe. Um, 
and they had a chance to hear one another out in terms of like, where did that aggression come from? Where did that breakdown happen for this person? And being able to identify why it's happening. And I think that's so important, especially when we're talking about the IP program, because it intersects with all of these things. And when and not many survivors like myself get a chance to sit across the table from the person who hurts you. Um, but when you hear it, it really does open a perspective where um, I can forgive this person and move on with my life. And I hope that one day they can forgive themselves and move on with their life and know that they can do better. Um, so even when we do advocacy, um, especially when we have our advocacy trainings, um, we always ensure that we include that piece of persons who cause harm and how it's really important to start having these conversations and supporting in their healing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a big one. That's so time, 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 time. You know, as <laughs> we're talking about the your friend structure. Yeah, we got a couple minutes. Quite Jeremy. But the... Uh, the, the, we were talking about that issue around forgiveness, though, because we, we talked about the influence of Christianity and Catholicism, and that's where that's largely rooted. And we we talk about that. Uh, it was actually group survivors, too, saying that 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 thing around uh, that forgiveness is um, is more about for those people who, who are in that power position. Right. We forgive the ones who got harmed. We forgive those th all the other stuff. And so we said, what is is there a traditional word for that? And to go back to the Ojibwe language, like there's a translation to let something go, but the concept really was about to have understanding of or have empathy for. So it wasn't that you really, it wasn't vital for your, for your healing to just, okay, I forgive and all these other things. It was to have understanding of why that person is acting that way. So our belief in values too is not that that person is bad, what happened to that person to make them angry today, right? So there's not an evil spirit. It's what happened to make that person that way. And that's where all of our conversations and, and doing these things, we start to pull that out and say, so how do we really use this and make our culture and teachings tangible and not like mystical, the ceremonies, you know, the crazy spiritual stuff, the spirits and stuff we go see in those fun things, <laughs> right? But how do we make that everyday stuff? And, and, and everything is about practical. Everything that we do, that we, the healing is practical. It's putting, incorporating, doing these things that are just basic, you know, really easy, but simple, but we make it complicated. That's the whole thing. And we lose that. And so leadership coming in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and another thing too is, you know, I, I was involved in a lot of circle processes. And one of the circle processes was the gathering of Native Americans really good mobilization for four days, you know, of elders, women, children, I mean, everybody, anybody, community, and bringing out the real tough, hard stuff, and, and, and the healing that began with all these, again, arts and crafts, I mean, just everything that we do that we have to release and let go and about forgiveness, again, to get into that point. But as always, as program people, we forget, we never, we, we don't do the follow-up. And that's the important piece to have be there supportive to continue the follow up and all that. So long Rod, ago, yes. I, yes. I wanna, we're, um, we're just over our time and okay. people need to get to the next session. So um, on behalf of the coalition and everyone who's in this meeting, uh, thank you all, uh, Rod, Jeremy, Jolene, for your wisdom, for your opening up. Um, both your, your, your thinking, your experience, your knowledge um, with us and sharing with us, and you've made us richer for that. 